we're going to get started because we have now just under an hour for, uh, I think, a very important panel, and we have an incredibly well-qualified and, I think, diverse perspectives on our panel. Um, my name is Amy Christensen, and I'm CEO of Christensen Global Strategies, and I do some work in the communications area and political strategy. So it's my pleasure to be hosting this conversation for us today. I think we all um, recognize we've had a number of, I think, failures, and we've inadequately informed or engaged and activated the public, particularly here in the United States, but I think around the world as well. So we're going to have a conversation about the U.S., but also around the world, where we are and how do we have that conversation, who do we need to be talking to, and what do we need to be talking about, and what methods and, and, um, and the kinds of um, avenues, how do we reach people to really get them to believe the information and to act upon it. So we have a great panel. Um, we have, to my left, Kit Batten, who is the Global Climate Change Advisor at USAID. She was uh, Agency for International Development. She joined them in January of this year, and before that um, was the Science Advisor at the Heinz Center, advising, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, I did a very short stint training scientists um, how to talk with policymakers in the media. So we're going to have great perspective on both science and on what's the developing world need to hear and how to help the developing world get on board. Because, of course, in the global negotiations, we definitely have still the north-south divide about what we need to do and how quickly on climate change. We have Jigar Shah, who's CEO of the Carbon War Room. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, founder and CEO of Sun Edison, a very successful solar company. Um, and we have Bob Perkowitz. And Bob is the founder and chairman of Eco America, and Eco America is dedicated to um, communicating with Americans to mainstream environmental values, and has done a lot of analytical work on where are Americans on these issues. And before that, was um, director of marketing at a number of organizations, a CEO of a number of organizations in the marketing and manufacturing arena. So I think a very good panel to give us some insights into this issue. Um, I actually wanted to start with Bob because um, of Eco America's work in assessing where we are in the United States where are Americans' values on environment and on climate change specifically, and what kind of conversation do, we, do you think we need to be having with them? Bob. Thank you very much, Amy. It's always a pleasure working with you. The, uh, um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, um, the good attendance here is, I think, a good indication of how important this issue has become. Uh, I go to something called the Climate and Energy Funders Group, and I was there last year in Denver, and in two days, maybe eight or nine sessions, they only had one session about engaging people. And now, uh, this past year, uh, when they had it in Chicago, virtually every session was about how do we engage other sectors, how do we engage people in climate, and the reason why I think we've all shifted is because uh, we lost this last round. Uh, just to go back a little bit in time, like 100 years ago, we had, you know, we were plundering the planet, the nature of the planet, and then we created the conservation movement. And we kind of solved that problem. We created a lot of infrastructure for that. After World War II, we came back and the rivers were polluted. You couldn't throw your kid in the water anymore. And then we created the environmental movement in America. And now uh, we've got this new set of problems, these global ecosystem sustainability problems of the atmosphere, the oceans, and this toxic mix of chemicals that we're putting out that is impacting us in a lot of different ways. And we haven't been able to bring along the public like we did the first time and the second time in this third round of environmental challenges. Uh, and, you know, we all believed that it was real and urgent global warming, and we made movies, and we made television shows, and we made countless books and, and magazine articles. It was all over the place. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day today, there's less public awareness and concern about climate change than there was five, six, seven years ago, uh, in spite of all that work and in spite of the fact that the, that the obvious signs of climate are... Um, are all around us and, and growing. So you ask yourself, how did it become this big cultural divide? How come climate has gotten up there with taxes and abortion as a super divisive issue in American culture and politics? And, and there's you know, about five reasons why Americans have fallen off to the wayside on climate. And the first one is because if you go back to that last round of environmentalism, the people that passed the clean air laws and the clean water laws, those laws worked. It took 10 or 20 years for them to take impact, but all over America, the air and the water is cleaner. So if you walk outside here and you say, where's the environmental problem? This place is frigging beautiful. <laughs> 
Uh, and that's the way it is for a lot of Americans. They, 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 the obvious signals of weather being hotter and then uh, the overall uh, environment around them have, has improved. Uh, the second thing is, is that this, this thing about climate change and the oceans and stuff, that these are vast, vague, complex, long-term problems, and we all know anthropologically that humans are not well suited to deal with those kinds of problems. Uh, there's a third reason uh, is that there's winners and losers in the climate game, that there's a, a lot of vested interests that, that make a lot of money by pulling things out of the ground and burning them for us, and those people have spent a lot of money engaged in a proactive disinformation campaign. Uh, fourth reason why we don't really get climate is, is a media thing. And what happened, uh, for those of you in the media, is in 1984, Ronald Reagan uh, did not sign a bill called the Fairness Doctrine, which had been around for about 50 years, which said that the media is a public trust and you have a responsibility to broadcast information fairly and accurately. And so what you can do is you can set up a, a any of us can set up a news station or a television station and, and we don't have to present fair, accurate information to Americans on what's going on. And you couple that with the thing about cable television and the, <coughs> the internet and how diffuse media has become, we all pick out the media that what we want. So even if you've got the right information and you want to communicate it to certain people, they might not go to the places where you communicate and the places where they go might not let you communicate information to them. The last reason why um, most Americans are not into climate is because we haven't tried to bring them along. The environmental movement in America has focused on policy and, techno and technology and science. We have, not focused on, we have not focused on building public support for climate solutions. So right now, today, you know, we've got this very low level of public support for climate solutions. And in fact, it's dead in the water. It's hard for a politician anywhere in America to go out right now and say anything about climate. And a lot of people that were very much for solving the climate problem, like John McCain five years ago, he sponsored three bills to stop climate change. Now he will not talk about the issue in any kind of positive terms. So that's where we're at today. And do you want me to talk about what we should do or wait till the next round? I'd like you to actually jump into what we should do. OK, what we should do. Okay. Give us some guidance. Um, so if we've got this thing and you say, well, what do you do to bring Americans along in climate? You have to recognize you only have three choices up front. One of them is this thing called communications. If you say the right words, the votes will follow. There's a lot of people who believe that it's just, we're just not explaining it well enough or right enough or connecting enough. That's very important, but all by itself, it's not enough. The second thing is that we have to accept it that climate is a social challenge more than a policy challenge or a science challenge. We've got to bring people along. And we have to realize when we're doing that that there's going to be a lot of opposition to it. A law of unintended consequences, wherever we go, people are going to respond in different ways to what we do. And then the third thing I think once we realize that you know, it is a social challenge and we have oppositions is that we've got to get very practical and real about the solutions. We have to stop being based on anecdote and intuition. Everybody has theories about it. Everybody in America thinks they're a great marketer because they've got to absorb so much marketing in their lives. But, you know, but the fact of the matter is that there is a lot of solid research in sociology, in psychology, in anthropology, uh, in, in economics, in marketing. There's a ton of research out there about how to communicate with people. We need to build that intellectual cap cap capital, do more research. We need to really understand in real terms how to connect and stop guessing. Uh, so we build that knowledge base. And then the second thing that we need to do, uh, and this is the stuff that Eco America, the organization uh, I work with, uh, does. You build the knowledge base, and then you have to build capacity. Everybody here should really know that information. And so what we need to do is share it. We need to have conferences like this. We need to synthesize it in meta reports. We need to share it with corporations, government, NGOs, foundations. Anybody who's into solving the climate problem has to really get up the learning curve on addressing it as a social issue. 
And then the third thing that we have to do is take that knowledge base and that capacity and turn it into specific programs. And uh, when I say that there's three things you can do, the first one is communications, the second one is contingencies, which is cap and trade or solar panel credits, ways of doing that less expensively, or laws, those are contingencies. And the third thing is to change the culture. So if you can go out and grab, and, and most this is hard to do, but you can grab a sector of American society like business, like Jigger's working with, or education, which we've done a lot of work. We did a program called the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, and we, uh, and it's too long to explain here, but in the course of the last three and a half years, we've got 700 American colleges and universities, including 22 state university systems, to commit to going climate neutral no net impact. The presidents of the school have signed a pledge. They have to measure and report, public report on our website system in a consistent manner all of their emissions every year. They have to take seven tangible actions to reduce their emissions, and then they have to come up with a plan to go climate neutral and implement that. So there's 700 schools with about 42% of all the higher education population in America students that are part of that program. So when you build a program like that, you know, then all the, the it's, it's, it's timed very well at people in a change of life stage that are receptive to new ideas, that care about the future, and all these, you can, as they go through these schools, the concept of sustainability and, and renewable energy and energy conservation will become part of their lives. And there's a bunch of other programs we've done like that. But I feel like I'm talking too much, so. No, that was great. Thank you very much for setting the context for the United States. And I wanted to jump to Kit, actually, to get your perspective on the developing world and where are they and the opinions of where we need to be going, where are the barriers, and where do you all see some opportunities? Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, and hello, everybody. I, uh, I'm very excited to be at USAID because a lot of great action on climate change in terms of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and investing in uh, real world adaptation strategies is happening at the, at the international level. So it's a very exciting place to be. One of the ways that we're changing uh, the conversation on climate change is to make sure that uh, we're thinking about climate change mitigation opportunities and adaptation considerations uh, throughout our development portfolio. So uh, the Global Climate Change Initiative is one of President Obama's top initiatives, as are Feed the Future and Global Health. Um, and so clearly climate change has a huge impact on how we're going to feed the future and food security, uh, whether you're talking about agriculture or the way fisheries are changing as a result of ocean acidification and changing um, uh, temperatures. Uh, and, and similarly with global health, if you're talking about decreasing water supplies, possibility of having more polluted water supplies, uh, and also looking at the migration of disease into, into new areas, those also are serious uh, concerns to be thinking about. And so my work as the Global Climate Change Coordinator is to make sure that we are not only doing great development work that's specifically targeted at adaptation and mitigation, but also to ensure that we're having these conversations across all that we're doing, and, and not just those other two initiatives, but also in terms of democracy and governance, in terms of gender issues, um, et cetera. It's all across the across the board, and so that's that's one great way that we're changing uh, the dialogue. And in fact, I would like to bring everyone's attention to that we're going to be releasing our climate change strategy next month, not tomorrow, but towards the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, and that outlines exactly how we're going to get to doing this. And it involves a lot of different steps. Uh, we're making sure that it's not just the climate change uh, experts in USAID that are doing climate change work. If you're working on democracy and governance, how do you think about climate change? How does that impact your work? Well, we're going to start providing training for all of our program officers across all of USAID to do that. And of course, we're doing this in collaboration with other donors, um, philanthropic organizations, uh, civil society, et cetera. So that's one way that we're changing the conversation. Another way that's very important is engaging uh, the private sector. And that's something that we've done well for a long time, but we're really scaling that up and ramping that up because clearly public assistance dollars are not going to get us to where we need in terms of investing in clean energy, investing in sustainable forestry and other land management practices, and investing in adaptation. And so we're doing that in a number of different ways. We've got a global development alliance where we're working with um, huge 
businesses like Unilever, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, uh, Intel to work on both um, adaptation and mitigation projects. And we, right now we have uh, over 1,000 alliances with over 3,000 individual partners. And they include these multinational companies as well as local companies, of course. Um, we're also engaged in the private financing advisory network, which is part of the UNFCCC technology transfer um, commitment. So we're working with so I'm a scientist by training, and I know that if I were, I've got a bit more training now, but if I'd gone to uh, an investor to try and talk about my research right after my PhD, I wouldn't have necessarily known how to pitch that in a way that an investor would want to invest in it. Uh, and it's the same thing for folks who are really um, very uh, in tune with the technologies that they're developing but d don't necessarily uh, know how to pitch it. So what we're doing in partnership with a lot of other donors around the country, around the world, is to work with those good idea people and connect them with investors so that those connections can be made. Um, another thing that we're doing is uh, we've got this got U.S. government-wide initiative called the Low Emissions Development Standard. Uh, and we're working with uh, 20 partner country governments, or we will be by the end of 2013. We're working in various stages with about 11 right now um, to help countries develop their own low emissions development strategies. So that includes sustainable uh, land management so that there's more carbon sequestration. We're managing for, for biological carbon sequestration. Also investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy, et cetera. But this also includes transportation, waste management across the board. Uh, and we're really making sure that we're talking about this as an economic growth strategy. Um, so really, this is about investing in the future. And there are adaptation components as well, because if you're not considering adaptation and the impacts of climate change, you could be making investments that will really be severely undercut by a changing climate. Um, and so this includes countries that are already big emitters. Um, like Mexico, for example, is one of our initial partner uh, countries. And then countries that are not already big emitters, like Bangladesh is another one of our initial partner countries. But in those, Bangladesh con economy is projected to grow, uh, and they're interested in being seen as a leader uh, in this field so that other countries uh, nearby can learn from their example. And so that's a lot to start off with, but that's, that's how we're working to change the conversation. Thank you. It sounds like you are initiating at least that conversation about the opportunity side of the low emission Absolutely. growth. I mean, when you talk about a low emissions development standard, it's not very sexy. It doesn't sound like, um, you know, growth and economic opportunity. And so, but you're integrating that into the conversation. And I was wondering, as just a quick follow up, back in the 90s, the Latin Americans were very much uh, leading on action on climate change because they saw it as a way to attract investment into their priorities around clean energy and development of their indigenous energy resources. Um, and so they very much were leading in the fights at the global level to get an agreement globally so that they could attract that investment. Do you see that countries are resonating with this message around this opportunity side of things? Is it, is it resonating? Does it come off as false to them? Do they see that this is actual opportunity? No. I, the countries that we're working with really do see this as an opportunity. Uh, and one example is Mexico. Uh, they were the first country to sign on with us in terms of wanting to work on this low emissions development strategy. Um, and, of course, Mexico also was a huge leader in the Cancun uh, COP last year and really has committed to pushing the envelope forward. Uh, USAID, uh, our mission in Mexico, is uh, uh, committed to a $50 million over five-year climate change uh, initiative and are working very closely with the government, specifically around this opportunity message. Um, I just was actually down in Mexico for a bilateral meeting on climate change and clean energy, and it's, a, it's amazing what they're, what they're doing in Mexico and amazing the number of partnerships that we have between our two governments in both of these fields. So clearly an opportunity okay. um, and not uh, not being perceived as, as, a, as a burden without any opportunity associated with it. Great. So Jigger, talk to us about um, business and how you all see business and the opportunities for business and leadership and market solutions in this domestically and internationally. Well, I think, you know, I think it's it's great to follow Kit's comments. I mean, I think that I think this is the largest economic opportunity on the planet, right? I mean, figuring out how to actually go away from, you know, the energy waste that we that we have today and and some of the other um uh, national security and economic security problems that we have from our dependence on <clears throat> non-locally sourced fuels. 
So for you know countries like Jamaica or the places where they have to spend 40 percent of their hard currency on um, importing fuels, therefore they can't use it on machinery to up update their factories or other things. You know, I think that I think this is all related. I I would say that just you know to be deliberately pr provocative, I think there's there's a couple things that you know just because I want to I want to hear what the audience has to th say about this. Is that I, there's a couple things for me. One is that is scale and relevance, right? And so, so the fact that people are doing interesting things on solar and wind and hydro and geothermal is, to me, irrelevant. Unless, unless 100% of all incremental electricity generated in the world today comes from renewable energy, right? And so the question is, how close are we to that number, right? In the U.S., we're at around, I think in 2008, before the financial crisis, we're about 64% of all incremental energy in the country was coming from renewable sources. So, um, and we're down to about 50% now because of the natural gas boom, but my sense is that we're actually headed towards about 100% of all of our incremental energy, not shutting down old coal plants, but all the new stuff that we're putting in coming from renewable energy within this decade. Um, in India, you're not there yet. Um, and I think the reason you're not there yet is because um, because there is this, as Bob was talking about, there is this sort of training gap, right? So when you talk to the folks at Tata Power, they'll tell you that every coal plant that they build today, they know they're going to shut down before its useful life, right? They know that, they, that when they build it, it will be a stranded cost. But the World Bank pushed them to take money at the Tata Munder project, and so why wouldn't they actually put money into that, right? And so, so there are some of these things that they have to do. And they know for a fact that they're depleting all of their remaining fresh water in India because, and in India, they don't have natural coal that's actually worth burning. So they have to import it from Indonesia and Mozambique and other places. And Indonesia, they know, is going to cut them off of their coal supply within the next 30 years because it needs its coal supply for its own people. So I, what I would suggest on the communication side of this is that we have to go away from getting people um, to buy a Prius, which is completely irrelevant, right? I mean, ultimately, buying a Prius, you need 300 million Priuses to save a gigaton of carbon. So your Prius purchase is not really going to do it. And I have one as well, so, so I'm, not, I'm not suggesting otherwise. But don't feel good about yourself just because you bought a Prius, right? I mean, and don't feel good about yourself because you turned off the water while you're shaving, right? I mean, ultimately, 40% of all processed water in Washington, D.C. Is, is unaccounted for, right? All the chemicals, all the energy, all the things that we we put into the water supply to make sure it's clean and drinkable. That water leaks out of the pipes and goes into the into the groundwater, which is not lost. We we can get it back from the groundwater, but all that energy and chemicals that we put into it is lost, right? And so fix that stuff before you actually figure out a way to shut off your tap while you're shaving, right? And the same thing's true for transportation. I mean, for my my challenge is, is that for the small percentage of people who actually care enough about this issue to actually write a letter or write their congressman or whatever, you know, like getting them to write a letter to, you know, their senator who doesn't care, you know, about this stuff is far less useful than sending a letter to your city council and saying, you know, we don't want you to widen the road by three lanes, right? Instead, we want you to actually promote ride sharing and car sharing in our local community so that we have a way to do this, right? I, I just think that on a communication standpoint, when you look at health impacts, people did this because they physically couldn't have their children swim in the river, right? Today, you know, saying that I'm going to buy something that has low carbon footprint shoe is ridiculous, right? I mean, the, the thing that they need to do is to figure out how to make this personal again for themselves, right? How do I actually figure out a way to significantly reduce the amount of money that I spend on transportation services? In San Francisco, they recycle 76% of their waste stream, right? A huge percentage of their waste stream. And it's 50% cheaper per person in terms of their waste costs, right? So they should be pushing for that in Fresno and in LA and in other places because they should have a lower waste cost if they actually like, you know, push to get more systemic recycling in those places. And so that's where I think communication needs to go is we need to give people a specific set of things to do to be civically engaged in their community around how you actually fundamentally change the, the processes and, and sy systems that we rely on to, 
you know, derive happiness and GDP growth and all those things. That's, um, it's very consistent with, unfortunately, one of our panelists couldn't join us, Kim Slickline, who runs Ogilvy Earth, um, which is the team working on sustainability for Ogilvy, the major advertising firm. And they came out with a study recently, the Green Gap Report or Mainstream Green Report, and they talked about this gap where the, um, they found that 82% of Americans have green intentions, but only 16 are actually dedi- 16% are dedicated to fulfilling the intentions. And so you have 66% who are ready, saying they want to do, but then there are all these barriers that the report talks about. And one one big piece of it is that it's perceived as expensive. So you talked about that, the economics and the self-interest piece of this. And I think that's what a lot of this conversation is about, is the economic opportunity for the developing world, for business, for individuals, and how do we make it about that self-interest opportunity and what to do about it. So as a quick follow-up to Kit, given that you've worked on helping scientists communicate the science, how important, I think it's interesting, how important is it to actually communicate the science of climate change versus just jumping right ahead to opportunity, solutions, clean energy, saving money, job creation, et cetera? So I'm taking off my USAID hat um, here. Um, I think that both are very important, and I think that uh, I think that a lot of points that you made earlier are very important. There are a lot of... I spent a lot of time thinking about why scientists don't do such a good job of communicating about the results of their research, and also why the misinformation campaigns have been so successful, leading to the reduction in the percentage of Americans and um, relatively recent study in the UK as well, and understanding that we need to act on climate change and it's a significant problem. Um, In terms of scientists, there are a lot of barriers in place. I'm a scientist, like I said. I'm an ecologist by training. And you're taught to um, only speak in in complete facts. And when there is even 5 or 1% uncertainty, you're taught to say that so that you are not overstating uh, your results. And so that's drilled into you from an early stage. So when you're talking with the general public and you're 95% sure about something, that's a lot of confidence in that result. And so being able to talk about that across this ingrained kind of training that scientists receive um, and not understanding that in the general public is something that's really important. Um, Secondly, there's no reward structure for scientists uh, to talk with the public. There's no training provided for the most part. Most of the scientists who become good spokespeople do it because they really care and they just go off and get the training um, in any way that they possibly can, but certainly not part of graduate school, certainly not part of um, early faculty or um, scientists who are parts of agencies for the most part don't get this training. And there's no reward structure. You're rewarded for bringing in research dollars. You're rewarded for checking the box on your teaching commitment. And if you have this extra thing, sometimes it's even perceived as taking away, or maybe you're now conceived, uh, perceived as an advocate because you've actually spoken with the public. So there are a lot of things that are uh, barring the way for scientists to to really engage in the conversation. And, and how to get over that are a number of different policy changes, and then also just recognizing that scientists have a responsibility to communicate their research. And if you're just communicating to the five other people who are experts in your specific field in an article in a journal, is that really the best way to go about doing your research. But uh, in terms of the the overall misinformation campaign, I would, I would all the things that you said are absolutely true. The other thing is so far the misinformation campaigns have a really simple message. But climate change is really complicated. And even in trying to simplify that message is calling climate change global warming, which you know the community made a decision to do. A lot of Americans don't understand that when it gets colder um, in the wintertime because the complexity of climate change was not explained at the beginning. So I think that it's absolutely essential um, so that we can, the other thing that the misinformation campaigns have done is really have denigrated science across the board and scientists personally. Um, and including some who've received death threats for, do, for their research. Um, and so there's a lot of repair work that we need to do in order to uh, re-elevate scientists to the status that they have in terms of conducting pure research that's really vital to the um, success and livelihoods that we have and the future of this planet. And so I think both. Clearly, we need to get to the opportunity discussion um, and not just focus on the doom and gloom because that really does paralyze people. Um, And I think that, you know, your points with respect to individual actions not being enough, absolutely, absolutely. But we also need to point to individual actions that can be taken. Otherwise, people feel like they can't do anything about it. So 
Right. Thanks, Bob. I was curious. I mean, you're setting up a new climate communication center. Do you think the scientific piece of this conversation is a critical part of it? What are you are going to focus on, and why? The science thing is uh, is very a very interesting debate. It's primary to communicating with Americans. You have to um, you have to understand number one that only 27 percent of adult Americans have a college degree. Only 6% of adult Americans have a graduate degree. Less than 1% of Americans have any significant knowledge of science. They can't think theoretically abstract into the future about a lot of different things, not just climate. And so we can go out and we can say, you know, like everybody says, you know, we got to get the communications basics right, get the right message, the right messenger, don't talk in jargon, and oh, by the way, the right messenger is a scientist. Okay, but nobody really connects with scientists or besides other scientists on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, if you do the research and you say, like, what is the best way to present science, the best way to present science given the polarization is to present it as a fact. Okay, if you get to 90, there is, you know, there's, there's contrarians who say that we don't know anything, we don't know that we're here, there's some other dimension, but, you know, <laughs> but when you really get down to it, you know, we are certain that the polar ice cap is melting. We are certain that the coral reefs are dying. We are certain that glaciers all over the planet are melting. This is, so if a conservative, and I don't want to say conservatives because I like conservatives, and conservatives don't want to see the planet destroyed. They're just getting a lot of bad information in bad ways. So, but if they come to me and say, you know, you guys got the science all wrong, I say, What's your hang up with the science? How come all you conservatives, all you can talk about is science? Why don't you pay attention to some simple facts? You know, if you put a lump of coal here on this table and you light it, are you going to sit here and do that? I mean, even a four-year-old kid understands that if you burn any fossil fuel, it gives off bad fumes that kill things. And if you do that, but with thousands of coal-fired power plants, with millions of tons of coal a year, it can have a big impact, and it's having a big impact. It's obvious all over the place. So you, you have to, you know, like you, you assume the science, and you just you try to get past that. If you argue science, you'll just you just come out. The worst, best you can come out is, you know. So argue from a moral perspective. Fight from the hilltops, not the trenches. Assume the science, and then you have to be empowering. You have to go out, and and at the end of the day, the ratio that we have right now, and we're, we're actually going to test this, is a ratio of about five to one of solutions. To the problems. So if you say that the coral reef is melting or, or dying all around and fish are going away and it's going to be a big problem, acidification, you know, then, then everybody walks out, about 18% of us feel like, wow, I got to do something and most of those people give money to somebody to do, do it for them to get rid of their guilt. But about 18% of Americans go out and they get motivated by that. But the vast majority turn off and walk away. But if you can come up to them and say, coral is, is dying, but this is what New Zealand is doing. This is what Scripps is doing. This is what the University of North Carolina is doing. This is what this community is doing. And oh, by the way, this is what you can do. Then you build this, this thing that, hey, there is a problem, but you build a sense of personal empowerment into people, and they feel like somebody can do. Some people are doing something, and they can do something about it. And then they walk away energized, wanting to do something about it, as, as opposed to saying, well, that's really bad. I can't keep that thought in my mind because it's going to ruin my personality, and then they go on to something else. So that you know, so science, you know, like science is, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't talk about science. It is critical to talk about global warming and climate change with policymakers, educated, intelligent people. But you know, I go up to the environmentalists. They say, I say, well, you explain healthcare to me. They can't do it. They don't know what it is. They don't know what this big debate is. They don't. Some law was passed or TARP. Explain it to me. Well, we all that get climate change think that everybody should get climate change. We don't get other big complex issues. Why should they get it? So <laughs> we follow our, our social identified trusted leaders mostly, and we've got to get more of those going in the right direction. But the main thing is, you know, uh, science to different things for different people, science to the right people, the rest of the people, it's a fact. Thanks. I'm just Kit, and then we'll go out to the audience for questions. Just one response. There are some, and there are some issues. I think that trying to further argue whether climate change is happening or not to certain parts of the public is not. There's no additional benefit from doing that because people are dug in. It's a hegemonic issue now. 
Um, however, uh, when I was doing this work, um, I was focusing on things like adaptation science. So how, what's the best way to actually adapt to a changing climate? What are the scientific experiments out there that are showing us how to do that? Um, similarly, what's the best way to sequester carbon in forests and wetlands, et cetera? Um, and what other additional co-benefits come from those activities that are important to Americans? So I would say that um, I think that Ameri we we I really do think that we don't give the general public enough credit sometimes, and making that assumption that they're not going to understand this and not even trying undercuts our ability to educate and, and gain traction in terms of supporting policy decisions to really um, improve the situation. So yes, not everyone's going to care, but I think that if we don't try, then we're not going to get that part of the audience either that does care if they only had the information. All right, Jigger, one last one. Just the, I mean, I, I had forgotten to mention, so we're, we're launching, I guess, a new global, or, well, it's U.S. communications platform. Um, I'm not sure if the name has actually been finalized, but they were thinking about Climate Nexus, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. And they've, they've hired their, their first person. I think the, the key to this particular one is it, it is absolutely protecting the science as, is one of its pillars. I think the other pillar was the, the hope and, you know, opportunity um, uh, message that, you know, that we do a lot of and a lot of other people do. But I think the third piece that it does, which I think is extraordinarily important, it's cutting people off at the knees. And so it's funding a lot of the work that's taking down the Koch brothers. It's funding a lot of the folks who, um, who are base, who, who's building, of course, we're in. Um, um, it's, it's, it's cutting off some of these other folks who, I mean, I do think that there is this notion that Gandhi and Martin Luther King and other people actually, um, you know, didn't cut people off at the knees. I mean, you know, just because they were peaceful and just because they didn't believe in war didn't necessarily mean that they didn't actually believe that some people were actually doing horrible things that needed to actually um, be called out and actually, you know, made to stop doing those horrible things. Um, and so I do think that that third piece is something that's equally funded in it. And I think that's, I think that's critical to moving this debate forward. We've had a, a gap where the other side has been very well organized and has been spending a lot of money on it, and we haven't been doing the pieces, the rapid response to mm -hmm. correct the situation. It really is a campaign situation that we're in, yeah. and we need to be stepping up to that. I think also I wanted to just quote a few things from this study and go out to the audience, but they were talking about... Um, for this study, half of the respondents, these are Americans, think the green and environmentally friendly product category, when they're actually going out to look at buying things, is for crunchy granola hippies or rich elita snobs rather than everyday Americans. And so there's this dis really powerful, I mean, those are pretty strong words, <laughs> very powerful disconnect there of this conversation and that we haven't been having an accessible conversation with them. Okay, great. Yes, Lynn. And um, we do have a mic. Do we, should we use that for the recording purposes yes. here? Okay. Actually, do you mind going over to the mic behind you? Thank you. Uh, Lynn Scarlett, thanks for a great panel and discussion. I, I want to make an observation and then elicit your thoughts about it. I think the challenge of the climate change discussion is that it actually is unfolding as part of a larger political debate. And that debate, I would say, is a resurrection of the kind of anti-big government and economy versus uh, environment storyline. And if that observation, that is, if, if this is unfolding in that context, then the challenge is not just one in communicating about climate. It's not just one of reaffirming the science, the nature of the challenges, but rather of delinking public perceptions that the toolkit to address that problem equates with that big government um, anti-economy agenda. So you've touched on that a little bit in discussing the opportunities that reside in a clean energy portfolio, but I'd, I'd like you to address a little bit more head on uh, that political challenge and that storyline in communication. That's a great point because I think what we, the conversation that was had with Americans was around a big bill that looked like a big government program rather than a conversation about the whole the role of business and decentralized opportunities all over the country. So any who would like to? I don't mind starting. I, I mean, I do think that, again, I mean, when you communicate these issues, it has to be personal, right? I mean, these macro things, I'm not sure actually resonate. And, and the thing is, is that there is actually a problem between big government and 
the economy, right? I mean, like, there are individual people that I know of, I mean, there are thousands of entrepreneurs on our platform who, like, you know, one entrepreneur wants to build alternative energy um, refueling pumps at existing gas stations. It's physically possible, impossible under EPA's current regulations to do that. Right? I mean, that is true, right? I mean, at the time at which you want to convert your car from um, the current fuel that it uses to natural gas, it costs $300 to do that in Egypt. It costs $2,000 in Europe, and it costs $6,500 because of regulation in the U.S. And so there actually are these problems, right? So I think that we have to acknowledge the fact that there are the law of unintended consequences that we just didn't understand when we passed these bills in the 70s and, and implemented them through legal... Um, legal uh, statements, et cetera, through the 80s and 90s. And now that you've got technologies that have come out that actually, you know, um, can bring us to a more superior environmental state, but have to have those changes in regulation, I do think that we have a very clumsy way of actually having that conversation. And so if you're one of those entrepreneurs who actually, whose great product has been stymied by this, and you've gone to all your investors and said that big government's the reason why I've been stymied, and gone to all your local politicians and said this is why I've been stymied, and, you know, and it's only 5% of the problem and 95% is this other thing, then, you know, I think you do end up in a, posi a position where you have to have that conversation. And my sense is, in fact, both sides are e equally calcified. I think there are huge percentages of the populations on the progressive side who refuse to believe the government can actually make, be made better um, by reducing the amount of regulations that we have in certain places and reducing the amount of things that they do. And there's huge amounts of people on the conservative side who use government services all the time to do their work and refuse to acknowledge that they do positive things for them in their lives, right? And so, I mean, I actually think that there's a real conversation that has to happen, but it's on both sides. And, and not only here, by the way, I think the Europeans have the exact same conversation going on right now in terms of, you know, what percentage of GDP should, you know, government be in Europe. Bob? Uh, Lynn, I, you know, going back to your thing, I do think that a lot of the big problem was that people were against the solutions, not against the problem, right? They care about nature, they don't want the polarized cap to go away, you know, they have some bad information, but their cap and trade, when you talk about an economy-wide cap and trade, you know, that's going to affect every product you buy at the grocery store, it's going to affect your home heating bill, you know, it's, it's a government takeover, this is the, the, the framing, on. it's a government takeover of everything, it's, it's socialism by the name cap and trade and oh by the way markets don't work we just watch the meltdown we can't trust the government to oversee the markets we can't trust the markets to operate in our best interests so yeah there's a big problem with associating with big government taxes uh, regulations and everything else like that and that that is probably the, the largest single thing that built up the negative momentum on solving it so what do we do Let's try to come up with a solution that people can buy into, okay? We don't have one right now. When cap and trade went away, it's kind of like the bus just stopped on the road and people got off and we're not going anywhere anymore, right? I, I have some, I'd love to do a discussion on what a policy solution for global warming would be that would substitute for cap and trade that would really work. You know, we've got the arguments about taxes and a lot of other things, but the main thing is nobody knows what to do right now. So. You have posed the key question, where do we go from here with solutions that we can all work toward to solve this problem? Okay. Um, so I would, I would just, um, I think that the, li the links that you're making are very interesting. And I think that it's um, anything that's perceived as being government telling you what to do um, is being perceived negatively. And that's even um, in terms of uh, the, the proposals that are going forward about limiting uh, the amount of sugar in soft drinks and et cetera. So it's across the board. But I would say that we don't have uh, no plan and that this is another example of how local policies um, and engagement with at the state level at the at the city level etc are being far more successful mm -hmm. because if you can see the impacts in your own daily life that uh, the mayor uh, has made possible or the governor has made possible, then you're much more likely to be engaged and supportive of that and so I think that um, I, I would hesitate to say we don't have any strategy for moving forward. I think that we have to keep engaging at the local level. That just requires a whole lot more work for national organizations to really engage in. Um, 
So I just wanted to add that. Well, just real quick, um, Bob, on the honest conversation, the conversation we need to have um, at a panel at Fortune Brainstorm Green, um, the head of American Electric Power, one of the biggest electric utilities, and the head of Vantage Point Venture Partners, who has a lot of investments in the clean, uh, clean tech area, were arguing about the price points of different energy solutions. And they were going back and forth. And it was clearly time different. So technology costs, clean tech costs are coming down so quickly that it even just from a few years ago, the cost argument was happening as well as geographic. And I was watching this argument, and I said, this is the conversation we need to be having in Washington in front of members of Congress, also in front of the public, about where are we with these solutions, how expensive are they, what are we, what's the path we want to pursue, what kind of benefits do we want through security and health, and can we have this conversation in Washington? And they kind of looked at each other, looked at me, and said, it's impossible right now in Washington to have an honest conversation on this stuff. It's just lobbyists fighting each other. So high, high level of frustration, I think, on everyone's part. Lauren. Yeah, no, hi, thank you. I'm Lauren Faber with the uh, California Environmental Protection Agency and also a Cato Fellow uh, here at the Aspen Institute. And uh, two points and questions. Um, one, I think I'd be remiss to say in the context of this discussion um, that in California, we last year basically underwent the most grand experiment on some civic engagement that Digger was talking about with regards to public's interest and support of California's climate activities. Um, and through through uh, Proposition 23, which lost by the widest margin of any vote taken place across the country uh, that year, and so essentially what we saw was how do we how do we bottle that? How do we contain that kind of support um, for for climate related activities? And, and why were why was the public so uh, engaged at that moment? And what we we we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, and I think we would say that the, the most important sort of messages um, that, that the public I think was receptive to were, were twofold. One was health, that the work that the state is doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions were integral to maintaining the state's um, health goals with regards to smog and air pollution. And that's something that, that individuals understand, air pollution. And also understanding that this was sort of the only uh, the, the fastest part of the uh, California economy that was growing at the time. So why would we stop it? Why would we sort of begin to lose competitiveness both within the U.S. and uh, more broadly? And so I think those are really important lessons, but also about with regard to what you're saying, who are the appropriate messengers? And that's also, I think, what communications firms across California really learned was how to engage the right messengers, and they weren't necessarily the politicians or even the environmental groups, mm -hmm. but doctors. The American Lung Association was by far the most influential messenger in California at that time, I would say. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's any thoughts about sort of how we model that um, and expand it. And that, so that's A. B is probably more direct than kid. I think um, one, a really important way of changing the conversation on climate change is sort of changing the way or improving the way the U.S. engages with the rest of the world on climate change. And that's something that since the start of the Obama administration, you know, by leaps and bounds has improved, but you know, still needs to be done. So I'm interested in understanding better sort of how the work that you're doing, low emission strategies, development goals, all those things are sort of directly integrated into the State Department's work sort of at the diplomatic level, not folks just coming in for particular large scale meetings, but sort of the diplomats that are on the ground, constant rep representation of the US. Is that directly integrated in their general diplomacy, sort of climate diplomacy, part of that? You know, I, I have extraordinary sympathy for the people that are waiting in line behind that microphone to ask questions. So I want to keep, I want to keep uh, the answer really quick so we can uh, get to you guys. California was a spectacular victory. I don't think the oil companies will ever, ever be that dumb again. And all the arguments that you made were the exact right things that got that bill passed. But California doesn't isn't the same as America. When we do research, literally we've done research studies in California and research studies that are the rest of America and things that you guys take for granted, these people don't even know. Know about we do not have the high we don't have John Doerr to go up against PG and E and C see how incompetent these people are we don't I mean you know so uh, love it and there are lessons to learn half hour discussion and <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about it Kit did you want to answer that sure and in terms of the work that we're doing um, the the LEDS work, the Low Emissions Development Strategy work, is actually it came out of the negotiations. First was mentioned in Copenhagen, um, was uh, written to the Cancun Agreement as being uh, an essential way of, of reaching uh, 
uh, lowering emissions globally. And we work very closely with the State Department. In fact, um, all of our initial engagements with uh, our partner country governments are with the ambassadors as well as with our mission directors in the countries. And so, yeah, we're working hand in glove. And I should mention that this low emissions development strategy, USAID and State Department are the leads on it, but we're working with EPA, with Department of Energy, with um, uh, U.S. Forest Service, USDA. So it really is a U.S. government-wide program, but it's, a, it's very integrated. Can I just give you two seconds on that? I mean, as, as a successful clean tech entrepreneur, I can say that, um, like I would say in the last year and a half, the U.S. has gotten better, but it's not even close. I mean, when you look at what Germany is doing right now, literally every single embassy has a weekly meeting for their companies in those countries. I mean, in, you know, if, if you look at the German reunification party in D.C., the entire party is about renewable energy. I mean, it's, it, is, it is mind-blowing to me how completely off the ball the U.S. Dipl diplomatic corps is in terms of promoting its countries for external thing. And I think OPIC and Exim and hard, hard programs like that are doing a great job, but the soft power stuff is not even close to what the Europeans are doing. I would say that we are not being wholly ineffective, however, I think that we're being very <laughs> effective. Um, it does take a lot of time, and honestly, um, when we're discussing low emissions development strategies with partner country governments, Frequently, they say, well, where's your low emissions development strategy? But the, th the thing is, we have lots of them. I've written some. I'm sure you guys have written some, others in the audience. We are lacking the enabling policy environment here at the moment. So we're working on not only developing the technical assistance for these low emissions development strategies in countries that might be lacking some of the elements of that technical assistance, but also working on um, the enabling policy environment. There's an excellent paper that folks should take a look at on that point, which is how do we not just leverage our foreign policy and our military money and might, but also our economy as a model for the world in order to influence the world by um, Colonel Puck McElby. Yep. Um, it's, I think it's what, called um, Mr. Y. I think based on the Mr. X story. Um, it's a fantastic yeah. piece, and it's led by two advisors to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The, it's written by them, and it's incredibly well done, and he's endorsed the piece. Yes. Yes, um, yes my name is Steve Johnson. Uh, I am finishing up a book uh, which I call Integrity at Scale. Uh, ask me about that afterwards. <laughs> um, I have a question and then a statement to make justifying the question. And the question is a very simple business uh, question. Which business is the, is the environmental movement in on this issue? Is the environmental movement in the emission reduction business, or is the environmental uh, movement in the post fossil fuel energy technology conversion business? I think the, the movement basically, um, you know, kind of out of habit, well, it feels like the Clean Air Act, put itself in the emission reduction business you know, 20 some years ago and hasn't really figured out if that was the right choice or not. Here's the logic frame, just very briefly, that I use in the speeches I make locally in Annapolis, Maryland. The technologies we have force us to consume fossil fuels. That consumption produces annual emissions. Those emissions add to the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A growing stock of carbon dioxide heats the planet more and more, and the warmer the planet gets, the more climate change we get and the more, the more damage we cause. To get the solution, you have to work backwards from that. To stop climate change, you have to stop the growth in temperature. To stop that, you have to stop the growth in the stock of carbon dioxide. To stop that, we have to stop the emissions from burning fossil fuels. To stop that, we have to stop the consumption of fossil fuels. And to stop the consumption of fossil fuels, we have to stop owning things that require us to consume fossil fuels. So I think we are actually, we have to be in the technology replacement business. The good news is, Consumer technologies we generally replace on about a 10 year cycle, and lots of industrial technologies are replaced on a 20 year cycle. We can buy our way out of this over 30 years by just buying all renewable energy equipment for the next 10 right. years. But back to the question which business are we in, and which business should we be in? <coughs> so, I mean, we've, well, so we've answered that question very clearly um, that the business of the environmental organization should be in the business of the, the former health and reduction of emissions. They, they are completely incapable of actually having this conversation of picking winners and losers on the technology side around how you actually figure out a way to move to the next generation fossil fuel techno uh, next generation energy technologies. But um, you know what our organization does is actually try to do that piece of it, which is working with entrepreneurs, but we don't pick winners and losers, right? So we're not telling people 
that they should pick electric vehicles versus natural gas versus methanol or butanol or other things. What we're trying to do is try to figure out a way to create a level playing field. I mean, I think what's clear to entrepreneurs like me and others who are on our network is that over the last 50 to 60 years, um, innovation on, in, in infrastructure is ridiculously difficult to make money on. And so you see this in the venture capital community. I mean, Kleiner Perkins has had a horrible track record in terms of their venture capital business on clean tech. So has Vantage Point. So has um, Greylock and all the other folks out there. And it's going to be very difficult for them to make to raise their next round because the scale, what you can get to sort of the $100 million a year revenue business, but getting from $100 million a year to the $100 billion a year revenue model in some of these solution sets has been ridiculously difficult because they don't have 60% gross margins where they can actually feed themselves through internal cash flows. So they do have to get advanced financing mechanisms, et cetera. So, um, but I would, I would suggest strongly that the, the environmental groups who have a lot of soft power should focus on public health and not on trying to figure out a way to you know, change the economy. Focus on the science, the policy, that advocacy work that they the do historically, they and do. allow the business leaders to work on the business strategies yeah. for how do we actually deploy the clean economy. Yes. Um, Dana Lossi, I want to ask a very good group. Um, my question is about going off the conversation you had with empowering the individual and giving them something to do after a conversation or after being faced with a macro problem. When you do that, though, you said also, don't feel good if you buy a Prius. I agree, you should make your home more energy efficient, uh, more carbon reduction than buying a Prius. But how do you take that individual action, say at an organizational level, um, say a business, a hospital, to actually the, the key factors that make the largest impact? I guess another way that I might be asking this is, what's the institutional acupuncture point mm -hmm. that has the biggest impact to create this kind of cultural change at the individual level, because that's what adds up to that organizational change. Who wants to jump in? Well, uh, you know, um, I would say that the best thing, the best leverage point is engaging existing social infrastructure that engages a lot of individuals. So if you can take a, take a sector like education, higher education, or parts of the business community, or parts of the healthcare system that interact with 15, 20, 30 million people, and you can change the culture and environment that, then you can get to the individual behaviors and change them. But I'm not sure if that... That's what... Let me, let me let me just put one thing in there. So I, I had an instrumental role in, in in getting Colorado to where it is today. Right, helped pass 2004, the the ballot initiative that you know that that, that required the RPS. We really gave a lot of money to Governor Ritter to get him in office. At the time, which Governor Ritter got in office, we actually gave him the five people or three people that we wanted him to be put on the Public Utilities Commission. Right, and those people are our people. Right, and at the time at which we put those people in, we went to Excellent Energy and said, "We've got you checkmated. This is exactly what you're." going to do, and if you don't do it, then you're going to actually like have this slow decline that pg and has had, basically, to bankruptcy. And frankly, Xcel Energy took the bull by the horns. They did an extraordinary job. They said, you know what? This is great. We're going to shut down our coal plants, and we're going to make a bunch of money doing smart grid. We're going to make a bunch of money being the largest investor in wind energy you know, on a per capita basis in the country. We're going to do a lot of work on solar. But the acupuncture point was the Public Utilities Commission. The same thing's true for water. There's literally, in every one of these infrastructure pieces. The ridiculous nature of this is there are five people who matter. And that's it. You know, I mean, everybody wants there to be thousands, and there isn't. And when you talk about water policy, it's five people that matter. And when you talk about electricity policy at the state level, three people here, but it's five people in other states. When you talk about transportation policy, it's like seven people that matter. I mean, the thing about this is what kills me is we actually know where the acupuncture points are. Because the folks on the other side of this have actually played that game really well. To give you one last anecdote. In Arizona, for instance, the Arizona Corporation Commission is one of the few states that actually elect their public utilities commissioners as opposed to doing this. Their entire campaign 
revolves around a $40,000 budget. I mean, for the love of God, I mean, if you actually want to, to change things in Arizona, give them a $50,000 campaign contribution and call it a day. I mean, you know, we all sit around here and spend millions of dollars on this stuff, and these guys are scraping for, because I think there's a statutory limit of around $1,400 to donate to, like, campaigns in, in Arizona. But nobody wants to write a check to those people or the strategic judges that are elected or the strategic other folks. There's tons of these acupuncture points, and there's only, like, you know, you know exactly where they are, depending on the issue that you want to, and, to address. And actually, organizations, I just put a little shout out there, the Clean Economy Network, I co-chair right. our PAC, and we actually uh, sent money to public utility commissioners, people running yeah. for office, because we understood those acupuncture points, but I think what we heard were there's acupuncture points and how do you best leverage and engage the public through existing credible organizations, uh, spokespeople they're already part of, so the hospitals having the conversation with people when they're in the hospital, or the zoos mm -hmm. having the conversation with visitors when they're actually in the zoos, but then also having how do you focus um, the, the major policy and financing mechanism leverage points to allow the public to act, such as through new financing ways to finance their home energy efficiency retrofits, which is the biggest bang for the buck. So I think there's some system changes as well as some public engagement strategies, I think. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm Courtney Height. I'm the co-director of the Energy Action Coalition. Um, we just brought 10,000 young people to DC. Uh, they're climate activists, and the, the message trade that works with them is going after the Koch brothers, you know, undercutting the corporate money that's actually influencing the process. Um, but I'm wondering, I, I don't think that message necessarily works in middle America. Um, so how do we move a multi-pronged message with the same kind of end goal? You'd, you'd be surprised. It does work. I mean, the only reason we won tobacco is not because people actually thought that the health you know, the health impacts of tobacco were awful and therefore we should solve the problem. We went tobacco because two really smart people realized that, that we, we were going to go after the executives by, by proving that they lied to us. And at the time at which we convinced the American public that they lied to us, they completely changed their mind, right? And the same thing's true in the Midwest. I mean, if you go to utilities in the Midwest, and, and you, I mean, I grew up in Illinois, right? A very small town in Illinois. Um, and, you know, you go to those, those people are good people, and they don't want to be lied to, right? I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that they can't eat fish in their streams and rivers now because of all the mercury that's in them because of the coal industry. And when, you know, when the coal industry actually says, no, this is completely safe, what was that stupid op-ed last week in the Wall Street Journal about the fact that, you know, mercury is fine and harmless? I mean, absolutely obnoxious, right? I mean, like, what we need to do is to figure out exactly who lied to us and take, a, take them down. And, you know, and Amy and I will disagree on some of the people that we need to take down, but some of these guys <laughs> are absolutely people we Even need to take down. Client. You know? And, you know, and these people, I'm not saying they're bad individuals. I mean, these people are good, God-fearing people. They go to church and they go to their, like, they go to their, like, you know, soccer practices for the kids. They're good people. I'm not saying that they're bad people, but what their corporations do is kill people, right? I mean, and you know, and and Greenpeace, for instance, did that big thing last week in Chicago. Forty-two people a year die from heavy particulate matter emissions from those two coal power plants in Chicago. Forty-two people that I think are valuable people, right? And clearly, const uh, you know, Exelon and uh, you know, and uh, Com Commonwealth Edison doesn't. Two. We only have a couple more minutes. Yes. Hi, I'm Charles Seifert from the New Economics Foundation in London. <coughs> I've got a question about changing the conversation. Um, there's, been a, there's been some mention on the panel of turning from problem to opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but that term from problem to opportunity is often couched in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of uh, investing in, in green jobs and so on. So but I wonder whether the, 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 there aren't, in fact, and I want to come before, there aren't, in fact, two problems that we can turn into an opportunity. One is climate change, we're talking about today, and the other, is a stagnant uh, median income, certainly in the UK and I believe in the US as well. Sorry, you said stagnant. stagnant median income. Uh -huh. yeah. Which I believe is a problem in the US as well as in the UK. Yes. And whether, if you take those two problems together, um, you can't start thinking about the, the real opportunity is to start working on increasing the quality of life you generate for any given level of economic output. Uh, and if you can start talking about that, start getting that into the public discourse, start getting that uh, uh, as, as a key part of the conversation, you might just start to be able to do the kind of things which uh, Bob, I think it was mentioning, that with cap and trade is impossible. But in the end, if you can start getting people to uh, see some hope, some positive improvements in their lives, uh, I just want to talk about that. 
I, there is there were the first generation messaging on climate, which is planetary destruction, the polar bears are going to sea level, and, and that went through about 2007. In 2007, after Al Gore's movie, we switched to what I call V2 of talking about climate, which is the social benefit stuff. Jobs, prosperity, uh, health, national security, energy security, and we all did that for, we've all done that for the last five or six years. And is, there's an argument that says that that kind of argument, that that has backfired on us. And I don't want to say it's backfired on it because neither of them, because that they're not the right arguments, we just make them the wrong way. When you say, like Jigger says, that 67% of all the new energy that's coming online in America is coming on from renewable sources, or you say 25% of all the jobs in America are being Created from new sources, and that and that the uh, uh, that there's maybe maybe there's only 90,000 people in wind, and there's nine million people in gas and oil. But every year, the number of jobs in gas and oil is going down, and the number of jobs in renewable energies is going up. So um, I think that tying uh, environmental benefits to economic growth and economic prosperity is an essential thing to do. You have to do it in unambiguous ways. You you know, if you really believe that it's going to create prosperity. You can't write an article that says, you know, green energy futures, all kinds of prosperity, and oh, by the way, it's going to cost each American family $326 a year. Because most people hear that cost and the prosperity thing, and they can't equate the two. So it's, it's like making moral arguments, believing them, taking into it you know, in a broader perspective. But I think it's, it's essential to tie. And, and I, do, I personally believe that the faster this country goes to a renewable energy stuff uh, through conservation and technology, who, you know, that, that that we will have a much more healthier, prosperous country. Can I? Yeah. I think that that's an interesting idea. Um, I think that uh, one of the uh, reactions that the American public has had about green jobs is, what is that? And that has nothing to do with me. Um, and so that type of argument about improving overall GDP by investing in the economic, low carbon economic opportunities um, that are available to us, and that that would help boost um, GDP and therefore have impacts on income for everybody, um, as opposed to only those who are involved in the green sector, um, could have some, some resonance. So one one thing I would add to um, those comments is that so Americans generally don't care about green jobs. What they care about is green entrepreneurs, right? So what's happened since the 1990s is that people really have recognized the Kauffman Foundation's work, which is that 80% of all jobs in the U.S. have been since 1980 have been created by firms in business less than five years. Right? And so, so if you want to create jobs, you actually want to create entrepreneurship. Um, and, and one of the things, I think one of the meta-narratives that we're working through is that, is that what technology has really allowed us to do on huge infrastructure problems is, um, is create the, there's this miniaturization of infrastructure that's occurred. Um, and I think, so in the 20th century, every organization from the World Bank to OPEC to all the other folks were were designed to create this bigger is better, right? Bigger desalinization plants, bigger coal plants, bigger things. Um, and I think this entire century is basically defined by smaller is better. That in fact, um, you know, reverse osmosis water purification system at the village level is far cheaper than than desalinization plants at the ports, and then you know, creating this huge infrastructure. Um, and the same thing's true with roads and bridges and all the other things that are there. And so one of the things I would say to support your point, but it's complex and the funny thing is Americans actually understand this complexity, but not in the not in the context of climate change. They understand the value of entrepreneurship, right? Which is why the Republicans continue to use this really ridiculously false messaging on taxes and small businesses. But um, but one last anecdote I'll give you is that. If you move to entrepreneurship and you move to this miniaturization piece, um, I was asked by the Republican National Committee to write their sort of talking points for climate change stuff, which they didn't end up using, obviously. But um, but when I presented it to their their leadership, 50% of their leadership were working in climate change, basically. Like, one, I mean, the treasurer was um, the head of a solar air conditioning company in Arizona. The other guy was doing this, and so I mean, they're all. It's not like they don't see the economic opportunity of this particular area and the entrepreneurial. Opportunities and investment opportunities in the area. So, I, I, I do think that they're that you're exactly right, and and I do fear that trend. By the way, I mean I, I do think that the reason why the three hundred dollars is such a big deal for American families is because their net income hasn't really moved up since their median income since the '90s, right? So, um, it is it's a huge problem, and it's it's one that that is completely tied into our solution set. 
I think that um, just to end on that, to go to our final question. Sorry, we're running a little bit into lunch, but given it was lunch, I figured we could run a little bit into it. It's a great conversation. It's a combination of data and anecdotes. And so data to show where, where what is the percentage of growth and the fact that 2009 renewables was the largest um, con contributor of new electricity, um, or wind was actually the number one add-on for electricity, as well as accessible anecdotes locally. So people can actually see this is something that's relevant to me, what you were saying. Um, and there have been studies done that show that the wind and solar jobs that are being created, they where they're being created has an 80% overlap with where we've lost jobs due to outsourcing because they're manufacturing jobs. So that those kind of data points, so it does feel mm -hmm. more tangible and real and uh, accessible to folks. And then finally, I would just point folks to Smart Power and the work that they've done, I think that's what they're called, that, to look at American public opinion on this. And they just don't think that these technologies are real or ready or cost effective yet. So it's a big challenge we have to overcome. Sorry, final question. Awesome. Hi, it's Allie Rogers. I'm the director of the Green Capital Office of the House of Representatives. Um, we support members of Congress with lowering their emissions, reducing their energy, um, saving taxpayer dollars. Um, and we have received, I would say, huge bipartisan support on the grassroots, if I can use that word for Congress, the grassroots office by office level. Um, Amy, you said that uh, um, obviously green means really different things depending on where you are from throughout the country. Um, so what advice do you have um, right now, especially given the changing politics um, of D.C., specifically the House, um, in terms of the keywords, um, communication strategy that we can be using um, <laughs> to continue to make this effective, especially when green uh, means many different things based on your linguistic background, your region, um, and even the word sustainability is changing in terms of what that keyword means in D.C. right now. Um, there are, if you get into the technology of actually communicating, uh, again, it's a half hour conversation, taking moral perspectives, scaling from, what you, know, you always start with a value statement. The second thing you do is you start with an ambiguous statement, like, you know, I really think this country is going in the wrong direction. Then you say, and I hear a lot of things from a lot of different sources. You take it to a personal level, you scale it up, you do moral arguments, you describe, you don't label. Uh, there's, there uh, you know, don't take notes on this. We can talk later. But I mean, literally, uh, we have distilled the ten report most. Report on this. <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got reports on this. But you know, we're consolidating them. We literally are trying to come up with the ten most important things, and it, it varies from from thing to thing. But just like, like I say, you know, you can, can if you go out and you say global warming, even progressives right now walk away because they're fatigued and they're you know they've heard it all and there's not much more you can say but if you go out with it and you say hey I, you know I, I think the weather around the country is getting a bit more volatile and I know just that the seasons are changing and uh, you know crab fishermen maple trees they're growing citrus in Jiggers, Illinois, citrus trees. That's supposed to grow in Florida. The growing regions are changing the USDA maps, and they can't plant oak trees in Chicago anymore, yeah. right? Okay. And then, see, so and now you're already at climate change. Everybody's with you. You're completely there at climate change, and then you got to lock it in. And there's different ways that you lock it into your brain. So there's a lot of specific technology on communications that you need to embed in your thing. And be glad to talk to you about it. But just. Uh, you go to Eco America website. There's a, a report called. There's actually three reports, and there's a fourth one coming out. But there's one that's called Climate Truths: Making the Necessary Connections, and there's a really good one that's going to come out in about August, which is the American Climate and Environmental Value Survey. But go to the research. We do meta research of other people's work because there's a lot of valuable stuff, and then we do our own primary research. But one other thing to add, though, is that I think the federal government has tried mightily to be a good customer in this area and has had a really hard time executing. Um, and I think part of the Congress's role is to actually figure out why. And I think you guys should do hearings about why we've got 14 different RFP structures for renewable energy and they're not getting um, rolled out to every single military base in the country. Why is it that like, you know, the United States Postal Service has done like literally 85 studies on the fact that electric vehicles are cheaper and about 15% cheaper on a cost per mile basis than, than diesel and gasoline they use right now, but they like aren't moving to that. Why is it that like, you know, that you have all these audits that have been done under the Clinton administration, under the Bush administration, et cetera, on energy 
energy, and we haven't actually implemented half of them. And you've got ridiculous amounts of private sector capital that wants that work. I mean, from Amoresco to Lockheed, two small companies that are in each district that wants that work. And and there's just these bureaucratic bottlenecks, which I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that if you guys made this a top priority, I'm 100% sure that we could shorten the amount of time that those processes take so that we can actually create more wealth in this country. Good. Final word? From the, from the executive branch um, perspective, uh, I know that uh, the Obama administration has been working pretty hard on cutting down some of the regulations that you mentioned earlier to make it more accessible for business to, to work with the government and to um, help uh, leverage public dollars. Uh, in terms of USAID, to bring it back there, one of our, um, this is not, again, sorry about the messaging point, but um, there's a whole initiative called USAID Forward that Administrator Shaw has launched, which is all about increasing um, transparency and um, getting other sectors involved. And there's a whole procurement reform element to that. So I think that, you know, it's a big monster to take on. Um, a lot of policies are made with very good intentions over many, many years, and sometimes they just get to a point where they're blocking each other because that's how bureaucracy works. But there are significant eff efforts by the Obama administration to um, eliminate some of those redundancies and blockages. Well, thank you very much. I think I would just end by saying we didn't even get to the overall operating environment in which in the United States that we're challenged by, which is the whole issue of campaign finance reform, redistricting. Um, there are major challenges here, as well as FCC rules. There are major challenges here that climate is just one issue where we don't have a public interest conversation in Washington and with the public anymore, and we don't have an opportunity for that because of those fundamental structures. So there are whole bigger questions we don't even get into at AEF. But please join me in thanking the panel. It's a fantastic conversation. Uh, you've got to, you've got to